The last part of our lantern project is to make the handle. Now for this project, we used some brass that we can bend into shape. Now the brass contrasts nicely with the wood of the lantern parts. And the other thing about working with brass is that it bends easily and cuts easily too. So what we want to do is going to start with a blank that's cut to our final length that's shown in the plans. Then I've drawn a center line on one of the faces and edges of the blank. Now to bend it, we're going to use a two-part bending form that's made out of maple. You can see that it has the flats on either side and then the curved shape in the middle. And because we're using brass, I can attach the forms to my bench vise here, just use some double-sided tape. That way I don't have to feel like I need four hands to try and get everything aligned. So I'm going to put the brass in place, keep it flush with the top of my bending form just so I can monitor the progress easily, and then shift it to make sure that those uh, center lines stay lined up. And it's just a matter of slowly cranking the vise closed until the handle is bent to shape. Bending the handle in the vise brings it down to its final length. So from there what we can do is mark and drill the mounting holes for attaching the handle to the lantern. Now I did that at the drill press using a twist bit. Now when you're working with thin metal like this, it's really important to do that safely. So use a fence and a clamp to hold that handle in place so that it doesn't climb up the bit and start spinning. From there I grabbed a, one of these artists or drafting circle templates. And then with a marker, I could trace the round over radius on the end of the bar stock. And then you can clamp it into a machinist vise here. Spend a little quality time with your metal file, filing the end to match that radius. Just work right up to your layout lines. Now what you'll find in all the handling that we've done on the bar stock is that it's gonna look uh, a little scratched up and dinged so what I did then is to use a sanding sponge and sanded all the way across on all the sides and the edges just to give it an even sheen and consistent scratch patterns, especially on those show faces. From there what you can do is use the holes in the handle as a guide to line up and then drill the holes in the top of the lantern. Now attaching the top uh, we're going to use a two-part fastener called, um, sometimes called Chicago bolts or binding barrels and screws. So there's a sleeve that just drops through the handle into the hole, and then you'll use the machine screw from the bottom side. And then thread that in place. And do that on the other side. I'm going to wait and let the glue dry on this top, and then it's time to apply some finish. Finishing projects always is a little bit of a mystery element for a lot of woodworkers. And when you get to an exterior project, things get even more weird. So what I'd like to do is go over a process and a product that I like to use on exterior projects. Now, when you're going to finish an exterior project, there are really three main avenues you can take. You can go with no finish, and most woods without a finish applied will gradually turn to a silvery gray color. It's not really been the look that I like. I usually like to preserve as long as possible the w natural colors of the wood. So a lot of times I'll use an oil finish, one that doesn't give too much of a sheen or a buildup. So that's option two. Option three is to go with a thicker uh, outdoor varnish where you're really building up a film finish on your project. A lot of times you'll see that on, you know, like old wood speedboats where they have a really glossy, shiny finish on it. Again, that's not really the look I'm going for, especially with this project. Now for interior use, I've been using a lot of water-based finishes. There's low odor, easy cleanup, and they dry super fast. There's also a product like this from Old Masters called Ascend Exterior. 
It's a water-based finish, dries super quick, but formulated for being outside. So that's what we're going to use today. Now when you're working on a project like this, getting ready to finish it, before you start dipping a brush into the can, you want to make sure you go over it one last time with some sandpaper. You want to make sure that all the surfaces are flush and smooth. And then I like to make sure any sharp edges are just rounded over ever so slightly. It may seem like a small detail, but softening and breaking those edges will allow the finish to adhere much better. Otherwise, on a sharp corner like that, the finish wants to pull away. So once that's done, what I'm going to do is work from bottom to top and from inside to outside. So here's what I mean. We're going to start by flipping my piece upside down. That way, I can apply finish to the bottom side and then to the underside of this cap assembly and even inside if necessary. To apply the finishes, I'm going to be using inexpensive foam brushes. What I like about these is I don't have to worry about trying to wash them out after I'm done or between each use. I can just toss them. Now on a project like this, there's a couple of tight spaces. So I took another foam brush, cut the handle off of it to be able to allow me to get inside there. So let's get started. I'll just dip in. And you don't want to apply a lot of finish, but you do want to apply a nice wet coat. So dip some finish and then start applying it on the inside with overlapping strokes in the direction of the grain of the wood. What you're looking for is that the finish looks wet, but it's not obviously puddling or pooling anywhere. And I'll get the bottom edges here that are harder to do when it's sitting upright. And with a water-based finish, this first coat is going to soak in so that it won't leave much of a build, if any, when you're done. I'm going to start on the underside of the cap. Then I'll switch to a smaller brush to do the insides. each of the windows. Okay, now I'm ready to flip this over, right side up. And then here's where we're going to go from the inside towards the out. I don't want to have to reach through really wet finished areas, so I'll start by applying finish to the inside surfaces. Then before moving to the outside surfaces, just want to give a couple of seconds here for any excess finish to start draining down that you may have missed or could be hard to see. And then you can go back with your foam brush and just kind of pick those up and soak them up with the with the sponge-like foam, just to avoid any unnecessary runs and drips. Then I'll work the inner edges of the windows. Okay, now I can start doing the sides, and then I'll finish up with the top. Now it's true what they say, watching paint dry or finish dry isn't the most captivating television. So we're going to step away a little bit for this to finish up. 
Now, unless you're in an area with high humidity, this first coat will be dry and ready for a second coat in about an hour. So we'll come back then. But before you step away, like I said, just give the finish like a minute or so just to see if there's any other obvious runs or drips that you can pick up because it can be really disheartening to come back to a really obvious sag in your finish. You'll have to wait for the finish to dry completely before you can apply a second coat. So how do you know when it's dry? Well, there's two things to look for. The first is that it's on a first coat especially, it's gonna look like there's almost no finish on it. The second is that you'll feel that the surface is pretty rough and almost hairy. And what happened there is that the water from the finish swelled the wood fibers and then locked them in place as the finish dried. So you'll want to sand those smooth. And if it's dry enough as you sand, the finish isn't going to clog the sandpaper, leaving little hard resin bits on there. And you're also going to notice this white chalky residue. That tells you that the finish is perfectly dry to be able to keep going. You don't have to sand very hard, just the light scuffing across the surface and it'll leave a really smooth finish behind. Now you want to use something pretty fine, nothing any coarser than 220 grit, which I have here. You can also use 320 or even 400 grit sandpaper. Once you're done, you can wipe off any of the residue, the excess residue, and then you can start finish. And once that's done, you can wipe off any of the excess residue and then start applying the second coat. It's gonna look a lot similar to applying the first coat. Start by flipping it upside down, taking care of the bottom and underside surfaces, and then applying it to the rest. What you will notice as you apply the second coat is that it's not gonna take as much finish to get that wet look. Again, you wanna avoid any sags and drips as you go along. I've put three coats of finish on the lantern, and that's the minimum recommended by old masters on their can. Now, it's really all about the look that you're going for. I wanted something with just a little bit of shine, but not too thickly coated. And I think this works out just well. And for being a water-based finish, I'm surprised that it brings out the color of the redwood as good as it does. Now, even though you're putting on a product called finish, there's still one more step to do, and that's to finish the finish. And for that, I don't want to use sandpaper because that's going to be too coarse. So instead, I found that uh, brown paper from like a grocery bag or craft paper, like we sometimes spread out on the bench here, is just abrasive enough so you can give the project a final rub down. What this does is remove any final dust nibs and ends up in a really smooth satin finish. Once that's done, we can reattach the handle up on top. We can call this project complete. Looks like I have one of my Christmas projects already done. <laughs>